Good morning and welcome to this, the ninth meeting of 2015 of the European and External Relations Committee. Can I make the usual request that mobile phones are switched off or on silent, please? Um, can I make apologies for Anne McTaggart, who's not with us this morning? Um, we've got a very packed agenda it uh, item this morning, two agenda items, two round tables um, on our inquiry about connecting Scotland. And our first item this morning is with the college sector in Scotland. And I think it's very apt that we are having this session today from the David Livingstone Room, given that we're talking <laughs> about our connections with uh, the, the rest of the world and, uh, and Scotland's connections with um, uh, parts of the world that we uh, view as our friends. Um, if I go round the table and just allow people to introduce themselves, uh, is, is, that, is that okay? So I'm Christina McKelvey, I'm the convener of the committee. I'm Hans Lamalek, I'm the vice convener of the committee. Willie Coffey, MSP for Kilmarnock, Northern Valley. Andrew Campbell, International Development Manager at Fourth Valley College. Uh, Roderick Campbell, MSP for North East Fife. Uh, Dougal Craig, Acting Chief, Chief Executive of West of Scotland Colleges Partnership. Adam Ingram, MSP for Carrick, Cumnock and Doon Valley. I'm Shona Pettigrew, I'm Head of External Funding and International Business Development at New College, Lanarkshire. Emma Meredith, International Director at Edinburgh College. Anne Kant, International Manager for Dundee and Angus College. Uh, Jamie McGregor, Highlands and Islands MSP. Margaret Monckton, Principal and Chief Executive of Perth College, UHI. George Hotchkiss, Assistant Principal, West Lothian College. Morning, can I welcome you all to, to committee and thank you very much for the written evidence that, that you have provided us. Um, we, we are gathering a huge stock of written evidence on this topic. It's obviously inspired a lot of people to, to write to the committee and we're very grateful for that indeed. Um, we're going to use sort of a round table um, example of committee rather than witnesses uh, given evidence. So we try to make the conversation as free flowing as possible, but if you could just catch my eye and channel through me, it means we can have some sort of an order. Um, I don't expect you all to be <laughs> um, jumping in anyway, but if you could just do that, it allows me just to, to, to flag it a wee bit more and hands Alice first in. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning and welcome to our, our, our meeting this morning. I, I've historically been very keen in encouraging students from overseas to come and uh, study at our universities and colleges and I, I know that recently there's been some issues about immigration difficulties for students to come I wonder if you could share your experiences with us in terms of how is that affecting your membership of students coming from overseas and has that in fact impacted on your financial situation as well as the uh, offer of topics that you may have been able to offer in the, in, in the past so straight in there I offer some feedback on that. Um, Perth College UHI uh, is part college, part university. Um, when we offer HE type programmes, we operate as a university. When it's FE, we operate as a college, so we straddle both sectors. Um, <clears throat> we had built up an amazing partnership uh, relationship with Andhra Pradesh region in India. And we were getting whole streams of um, Indian uh, students who were aspiring to be aircraft engineers because the aircraft industry in India was um, being invested in. So it was helping the Indian economy, it was helping our economy. And we were getting up to, well, over 200 students a year studying on our um, aircraft engineering degree. Uh, then uh, we... I were subjected to changes under the Tier 4, UK BA and now UK VI, um, the post-study work visa, because the Indian continent is a pretty poor uh, continent. We had to heavily discount the fees. So actually, we were only receiving the same for an international Indian student as we were for a home student. So there was no premium for us. So this was truly in order to be international and to have that diversity within our campus. So they came to us for um, year two onwards. So they would do their year one of their degree in India and they did year two, three and four um, in Perth. I, the Perth uh, economy 
got very used to having a lot of Indian students around. Um, they're very respectful, they're very uh, positive young people, and their families have to save up incredibly hard uh, to pay for the money that they have to uh, vouch for as being able to uh, live in the country um, on, on a funded basis. So <clears throat> these uh, families had to uh, make major sacrifices in order to send their sons, mainly their sons, but we had some daughters as well, which was very pleasing um, to study in Scotland. And a big part of that was them being able to work for two years after the degree where they could contribute also to our economy. Um, they could do some further useful learning in getting their EASA Part 66, which would license them as engineers back in India. So we could add value to their degree, but also they could earn money to pay back their, their parents. Uh, so that was a significant um, part of the equation. And then the UKVI, I think it was the UKBA, put in all of a sudden in a July one year that they wanted an additional £3,000 deposit from Indian families. So not only had they to vouch their... Um, they could pay their fees and they could live in Scotland for the years that they were studying. They also had to put in a bond of £3,000 in addition to that. So those who were in the pipeline... Um, actually dropped out the pipeline because it was just a step too far. I understand the immigration dilemma in the country, but students um, are not part of that dilemma, in my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, th I think that's maybe where the problem is, that we seem to be classing students as immigrants rather than students, which is a totally different category altogether. And I think if they were to remove that category or reclassify that category, it would change uh, a lot. And I think, uh, I'm not sure about other colleges as well, but um, we in Glasgow seem to be suffering similar experiences. Uh, and it was, it was important to get uh, some feedback from colleges uh, who can verify that that, in fact, is an issue. We now have no pipeline um, after 15, 16 we have no pipeline coming through these partnerships. Mm -hmm. It simply doesn't work. So we've gone from over 200 students coming through from these universities and some direct spot entries um, to nothing wow. um, in 16-17. We will have no progressing students and no new students from India. Is that, is that a similar experience in others? Yeah, I've got Shona and then Dougald. <clears throat> So I, I would just reiterate what you said. At New College Lanarkshire, we're very much reactive in terms of international student recruitment um, because of the, the, the difficulties you describe. I know within our region, South Lanarkshire College, um, in the past have had a large number of international students and are facing the same issues that you describe moving forward. Um, I think these individual examples demonstrate that the, there is a real strategic problem here and, and I think it demonstrates the need for the government and the parliament to work in partnership with the sector to progress this. One of my roles is uh, I, I'm the only college-based uh, member of a team called the UK Team of European Higher Education Area Experts and we are tasked with the role of promoting um, better international engagement for the HE sector. Now, the HE sector does include colleges. As you know, it's 25% of HE in the UK is, is done in the college sector. So there's a team of us that are going to be going around about the UK over the next 18 months, encouraging people to engage, encouraging institutions to engage more effectively internationally, to increase the number of students that are coming in to do short cycle programmes, degree programmes, masters and PhDs. But at the same time, that, that message is driven by DBIS, but at the same time, you've got the um, Foreign and Commonwealth Office that will be making it difficult for people to get um, visas to get in. But the other frustrating bit about that is there's a big pot of money available under the Erasmus Plus programme called International Credit Mobility, which is there to support um, the development of relationships between UK institutions and institutions all over the world. 
So it funds things like sending staff and students over and bringing them in. So it, I think there's a strategic issue that needs to be addressed, and I think we as a sector need the government and the relevant civil servants and the government to to fight that case for us. Emma? Recruitment, um, I think I'd agree with the comments that have gone before um, about the reduction in student numbers to the college sector in Scotland, but also in England and Wales as well. Um, and it's probably also evidenced by the number of colleges now who don't have a Tier 4 licence because the risks involved in student recruitment are too high. Uh, versus the numbers that they can they can safely recruit, and you'll see that many colleges have had to change the markets that they operate in because uh, a number of them are deemed to be high risk. Um, I think this is very unfortunate, but this is the position that we're we're in at the moment, and that's the the immigration policy. Therefore, it's it's a non-negotiable part of international activity that you have to work within the parameters of Tier Four, and you have to do it very very carefully in order to retain your license. Um, and until such a time as that policy changes. I, I don't see the number of international students growing coming to the college sector in Scotland, which is a huge, huge shame, given uh, the fact that there is a rise around the world in the need for vocational skills and training, which we are best placed to offer. Um, I also feel that the colleges, in terms of the student applicants, are treated differently to university applicants. It's very hard to actually evidence how and exactly why this happens, but in terms of the number that will go for a Tier 4 credibility interview, for example, it's pretty high from the college sector. However, I think at the same time it's, it's important to recognise that student recruitment is only one part of international activity that colleges can be engaged in, uh, and that many colleges will have changed their strategy to be engaged in, for example, Erasmus+. Plus projects but in vocational and professional training that this is a huge source of potential growth for the college sector and that we have a lot more to offer other than student recruitment it should remain part of our strategies but there's a lot more work that we can be delivering as the college sector in Scotland. Okay, Jimmy you've got a supplementary. Well I'm interested in, in discussing with the witnesses um, you know how we can how they can achieve um, better international engagement if, if, and the difficulties of that. And I noticed from the paper from Western Scotland College um, that they say um, it's notable, with the exception of Western Scotland's support to its member colleges, there's no overarching European or international engagement strategy for the college sector. And it goes on to say, which you mentioned that before, yes. um, you recognise that the leadership of, of such strategy should be vested in the regional chairs, but it should also take cognizance of the Cabinet Secretary's guidance for colleges. And then you end up by saying that you contend that the, in the absence of such a strategic approach limits the sector's capacity to generate a significant a European and international impact on skills and learning as its expertise should permit. So I suppose what I'm asking you is it, the, the, how much... Uh, do you rely on the Cabinet Secretary's guidance? I mean, does everybody think that? Do they think that they should be guided by the Cabinet Secretary? And the second thing is, uh, how, can, um, you know, how can we improve things so that you can get more international engagement? Can that do? Yeah. Um, the colleges have a responsibility to follow the Cabinet Secretary's guidance. That's the, the way the SFC directs funding, and the colleges have a responsibility to meet the regional outcome agreements. Um, so um, that, that, that's a given, that's just part of the daily operation. You're suggesting here that there isn't any guidance? No, what I'm suggesting is that unlike um, other sectors, health, universities, enterprise, we have a set of aspirations in the college sector at the minute. They're pretty diverse. I agree with Emma, it shouldn't just be about international student recruitment. There are other things that we can do, but we don't have a collective strategy for taking us forward. If I compare the Scottish college sector with the Northern Ireland college sector, for example, um, they, they recognised that they were quite far behind in international engagement. Um, so, as a consequence of that, the Northern Ireland executive developed a strategy to help um, support college efforts to improve their international engagement. And they engaged with the colleges to see how that could be, be taken forward. They provided some funding, a fairly modest amount, some Forty, fifty thousand pounds over a, uh, uh, each year for two or three years. Um, but the other part that's important is, in order to build relationships with other countries, uh, 
and to influence uh, external funding streams that could support the college sector in being more effective, we need representation on the relevant committees. And if, because I, I, I do work with the university sector as well as the college sector, what I see is the civil servants in the Scottish <coughs> Government who work with the university sector on international engagement and things like that are pretty well aware of all of the opportunities and forums that could influence those opportunities that are around, and they engage with them. I don't think we join that same level of engagement from the civil servants who are responsible for the college sector part of things. Um, I see some colleagues nodding their heads, so I'll, yeah. I'll take that as a sign of agreement. So I, I think we need a, a strategy that, that's driven from the, the Scottish Government, and I think the Scottish Government should uh, help us articulate a vision of where we want to go. Uh, I think we should set targets, not just in numbers, but in the quality of things we'd like to do and on perhaps the countries with, with whom we'd like to engage. Mm -hmm. But I think that strategy needs to be resourced. And I think there are good examples in Finland, there are good examples in Sweden, and there's a really good example in Northern Ireland where you know, a fairly modest investment can start to um, make quite significant uh, differences. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Margaret. Just introduce another barrier to us being able to do that. There's no um, limit to our aspirations um, to be effective and to engage internationally. Um, but we have been reclassified. The colleges have been reclassified by the Office of National Statistics, and we are now central government arm's length bodies. That restricts the amount of um, uses that we can make uh, of commercially generated income. Now, I'm not saying that we all engage in international activity only to earn commercial income. I think that's a nice um, side uh, line and a benefit of true internationalisation of our curriculum and our economy and our social fabric within um, the colleges. I, we, the current situation is, if we generate commercial income, we have to spend it in the year it's generated. So we can't use it for longer-term investment purposes. So we act like chickens without heads um, and try to get rid of the money quickly in order to not lose it. The other alternative under the um, restrictions that now apply to us as, as organisations is that we can sterilise the cash that we gain from commercial activity, which includes international fees, um, by transferring that cash into arm's length foundations and then bringing it back out again. So we can convert the cash by just transferring it in to an arm's length foundation and back out. So the complications that are arising um, and hampering our ambition and putting us in a box from which we are desperately trying to escape, not because we disagree with the classification, but we disagree with the fixes that have been put in place by the government in order um, that they, they still want us to engage internationally, they still want us to generate commercial income, but there's no joined up thinking as to how we can usefully reinvest that money in our college premises, because that's why we were trying to generate income in the first place, was to reinvest it for all our students' benefit. So that, that puts a different complexion on the anxiety being currently caused by the amount of millions that are currently sitting in arm's length foundations. Most of that was generated over the years by colleges um, who were um, looking at this as a long-term investment strategy um, on their campuses for the benefit of all students and paid for by their international activity. But can I just go, go a step back and, and challenge in a way uh, WASCOP uh, in um, their, their statement about lack of strategy. Um, the college sector, it's fair to say, has undergone rational change um, since 2013, and uh, our uh, overarching agency, Colleges Scotland, has indeed been in the throes of, of radical change, and we are just getting there in joining up um, the efforts of the sector and 
our overarching agency, College of Scotland. So College of Scotland board um, comprised mainly of regional leads, and these regional leads were appointed by the then Cabinet Secretary, Mike Russell, um, to represent or to sort out the college sector. Um, and a, one of those who happened to be um, a, a great guy who was affiliated to St Andrews University led an international working group as a regional lead. And if the committee members would refer to the paper that they have from Colleges Scotland, and indeed just go to the annex of that paper, you'll see that the early work that was done to pull us all together um, under Stephen McGee established principles with which we could then develop a strategy and a coherent strategy. I, life moved on and these regional leads went through a public appointment system and became regional chairs and they now form the, the College of Scotland board. So um, international has not been lost. The focus on international has been dented by UKVI and by a reclassification. But uh, the Corporate Affairs Committee of College of Scotland has a, a grip on um, a future international strategy for the colleges in Scotland. It's just, it's where we are. Um, we've had a lot to do, and international has been deprioritised quite rightly because we're doing all sorts of other things just now to act as a coherent sector. Um, there's one, sorry, can I just, if I can, just briefly um, give you another example give you another example of um, the, restrict, the impact of the current restrictions from UKVI. We have, we, have a separate, we have a separate limited company called Air Service Engineering Training Limited. Um, we, as a college, bought that company. We wouldn't be able to do so now under ONS, but we bought the company in 2000. It was going belly up. Um, so it's a wholly owned subsidiary of the college. It's got nothing to do with the university. It's wholly owned by the college, Perth College. Um, it has been trading internationally for 85 years, um, training aircraft engineers and pilots uh, across the world. It has been just recently recognised in the Queen's Award for Enterprise for International Activity in this round. So two representatives from AST will be going down to Buckingham Palace and receiving the award. I've got the badge on my lapel, but it's quite tiny. But we're very proud of having earned that for international business within the college sector, although it is under the name, quite rightly, of Air Service Engineering Training Limited. It is a wholly owned subsidiary by the college. Um, and we have a current contract with Libya that's in place. And Libya, as you know, is a very, very complex country just now. Um, that hasn't deterred AST. Um, the Scottish Government want us to support the Libyan Government. There's a few Libyan governments just now, but we know which one the Scottish Government want us to support. And we are working with that government in Tripoli. Um, we have a signed contract for 46 Libyan engineers and 40 pilots. Um, it's two years worth of training. It's at commercial fees. And the essence of that is that we want to establish um, the skilled workforce in Libya because it has taken quite a dent recently because uh, trained engineers and trained pilots are essential to rebuilding their oil and gas industry. So this is to help the Libyan government. It's also to help us, because it's commercial income. So we received, we, we have the signed agreements, but we're not that daft. We didn't put anything in place until they paid the money. So we asked for money up front. We eventually got £480,000. We received that on the 28th of March, and we had to get rid of it before the 31st of March under ONS. So we had to transfer it to our arm's length foundation in order to keep a hold of it. 
So we got 480,000. That's the fees for one year of training. I, we need, they are being fully supported to the tune of £1,200 per month per student on top of the fees for living allowances. I, we had to secure student accommodation for them. Dundee City had over-expanded their university accommodation. We're about to sign an agreement to use spare capacity for uh, student accommodation in Dundee. I, we will be transporting the students daily because they will be uh, studying 9 till 5. That's their work ethic anyway. 9 till 5, Monday to Friday. So we'll have them uh, gaily occupied. They won't be roaming the streets. Um, we will pay for their transport from to and from Perth every day. Um, the location is beside the mosque in Dundee. Um, we have to look after them socially as well uh, and pastorally as well as um, educationally. And we have employed an extra member of staff to be their mentor on the on the streets, so to speak. Um, we are only able to do this because of the ambition and the track record of this company across the world. They're trading in Africa, they're trading in Indonesia, they are trading all over Europe. Um, in all the countries, we have a second site in Karachi, which we had to fight the CAA on. So there is some very, very interesting international activity, well hidden, by the college sector, not talked about. We're not supposed to be doing it because we don't have the financial framework and the status to be able to do this well. OK, thank you very much. Um, I've got Andrew Campbell. Yeah. Um, just to pick up again um, on the, the, the student complexities around the UK VI, um, and I suppose a perspective from Fourth Valley and where we are, um, an ever international journey. Um, we, we're relatively new to this, this arena, um, although we have a, an absolutely fantastic proposition for an international market. Um, and our strategy, which we just, re just recently launched, kind of focuses um, I suppose essentially across business and commercial engagement, so a bit like Margaret's projects that she was referring to there, um, student recruitment and mobility, uh, as Dougal uh, mentioned to earlier, on, earlier on as well. Um, now, how we actually engage it and the timing of that is, is fairly significant. The recruitment is pretty much um, backloaded. We are very reactive at the moment to any applications, purely because of the risks involved. Um, the reputational risks are absolutely huge um, and impact daily on our, um, our kind of business engagement aspirations. You speak to any international partner abroad, their first question is, do you have um, HTS status? You know, are you able to help us with the visa requirements um, and if you're straight away say no then they move on to the you know they will move on to the next regardless of your proposition so clearly for us um, that indicates that there is a real barrier from the UK VI and I suppose the the requirements and the onus put on colleges to ensure that the applications that they um, take forward are actually going to get you know um, ticked off at the home office and we have no real control over that um, you know, essentially, we, we have very little control over that. So, you know, that's why we, are, we will remain at, reactive to our international applications and not invest heavy funds, if you like, um, in going abroad and trying to recruit international students. And picking up from what Emma said, that is to the detriment of, of the college sector as a whole. Um, the international dimension to any college, any institution. Um, the benefits far outweigh any negatives um, in, the, in the Home Office. So, um, and some of the international projects that we're also involved in uh, around our business engagement are, are predominantly around oil and gas and engineering. Um, we're obviously finely placed in, in Grangemouth. Um, we have a, a host of global brands that we currently work with in the UK. And we're, um, we're extending that. We're working with BP in Oman. Um, we have a meeting next week with Sonegal Oil from Angola. Um, and a couple of uh, oil companies from Ghana. And what we're trying to do is, I suppose, um, minimise the risks for us. Where we can get a company to sponsor a student 
it's going to better their chances rather than going to the open market for kind of student recruitments. Um, so that's one of the ways and one of the strategies that, that we're kind of um, working on at the moment. But if I can rewind slightly just in terms of how we've actually built our strategy and the stakeholders that we've consulted, uh, we spanned three local authority areas. Um, each of those three local authorities built, bought in and contributed to our strategy. And it's in keeping with their citywide strategies as well. So that would be CLACs, CLAC Manager Council, um, Stirling Council and Falkirk Council. But more than that, we've brought in the Scottish Government policy team to find out exactly what they're doing, what they want, you know, wh what direction they could give us, I suppose, as a steer in building our strategy. But equally, the exporting body, SDI, um, were, in were involved at very early stages as well. Um, and to answer the, 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 the initial question, could we be doing more? I'm a great believer in collaboration. I don't see any of it across the college sector. Um, and if it does happen, it's very, very quiet. We don't shout about it. I look at our uh, counterparts in higher education. They have a brand, um, Connected Scotland. That's a great opportunity to market to the, to the, 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 the international market, student recruitment market. It would be great to see something similar for the college sector as well. Um, and perhaps that, that, that might be on the agenda, but you know I've not heard anything um, yet from with regards to that. So we did invite Colleges Scotland to a committee, but they thought it better to send a representative college, so hence the reason why you're all here. But we hear you loud and clear. Anne, I've got you in next, and then I've got uh, Dougald, and then George. Anne. Okay, um, two things. Um, regarding the international recruitment, um, from Dundee and Angus College, I would say it's certainly been organic. We haven't jointly gone out and promoted anything. However, over the last six months, um, we decided that we wanted to collaborate with both the city universities to make sure that when we are representing um, our region that the student can fully have a wonderful educational experience linking where we've got joint accreditation on certain courses. So that's where we are from a, from a recruitment perspective. On the international um, Scene. What I would like to say is that Dundee and Angus College have a very cohesive um, international and European strategy. And we've had to really put that in place because we have are engaged in over 21 European projects. And they span from Erasmus Plus, Interreg projects and mobilities. These, rather than have a negative um, Feedback. I would like to give you a very positive feedback because through these projects we have built up a collaboration of partners who have assisted us time and time again in making sure that we can identify regional issues that are common to all of us, how we can work collectively together to transfer knowledge, um, understand best practices and disseminate that throughout our regions. But more importantly, it's about embedding that learning into our curriculum so that the best practices and the learning techniques are kept up to date so that our youngsters can then have the full vocational training, both academic, social and personal to be able to go into the workplace. So our collaboration is bringing industry into the curriculum so that they're telling us what they need so that there should be no reason why our students can't get employment. But taking the mobility side and allowing our students to actually go out, and our college has been one of the, the ones who have benefited, benefited from the Scottish Saltire Scholarship. And I personally took two groups of students to the United States to study and work. And can I tell you, the feedback I got from them was it was able for them to understand that the challenges that they face are the same challenges that the students face wherever they are and how they've got to work together, that our borders are smaller and that they have to think global, not local. It raised their aspirations and can I just say it was life changing. Okay. Thanks very much. And I've got Dougal and then George. Uh, I'll just I'll try and do four very quick points. Um, uh, in answer to the, my remarks about the absence of a strategy, I, th I think Andrew's remarks under, underline that. I, I'm, I'm, I've worked in international education long enough to remember in the 1990s when we'd 
Scotland's Polytechnic College group that we got together. It was the six main colleges that did inter international work, and we attempted to collaborate. But in the end, because of the nature of the, the way in which incorporated colleges had to function, we, we only co collaborated at a, a surface level. As soon as we get into a room, we were competing against each other. And that's the reason why I think any strategy that we have needs to have government involvement in it. The way the, the, the sector has now been st structured, we're responding to regional agendas. And each of our colleges gets some significant strengths and unique strengths. And those are really, really relevant uh, in the world today. Yeah. The universities have done well in international engagement because um, people want to buy our higher education and access it. But there's a huge demand for quality vocational training emerging in the civic countries, the emerging 11, whatever you want to call them globally. And the colleges are the best place to deliver that. Um, one of the problems you have, though, is everyone knows what a school is and everyone knows what a university is. There's no global equivalent of what a college is. So one of the ways we've tried to tackle that in WASCOP is We've made sure that every one of our colleges has an Erasmus Charter for higher education because everyone in the world knows what that is and it gets you through the door. The second point I'd make is um, um, that um, I think there's a false distinction uh, still persisting in the sector between what is European and what is international. And I think it's a handful one because there are at least a dozen EU programmes which have a global reach now and which offer funding of up to 100% to take things forward. And I looked at some of the evidence that other people had given in the, the first call for evidence and I saw things like uh, one of the bodies was saying they'd helped a university uh, develop a joint or double degree. And I'm thinking, well, I hope we didn't put money into that because that could all be funded directly by European money. Um, so there are opportunities there. But we need, to, we need to influence how that money is awarded. And the way we have to do that is that's got to be done at a strategic level. That means that the Scottish Government has to make sure that we get chairs, uh, seats on the chairs, uh, seats on these committees that are influencing funding. The Health Department's done it well. The Enterprise Department is doing it well. The Transport Department did it well with the Interreg programmes. We need people to do that for us in the college sector, not just for the university sector. And the... The third point I would make is that um, I think that we need to um, I acknowledge Margaret's points that we, 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 are, we, we don't have the funding now to be opportunistic and um, uh, develop things as much as we'd like to. And by the same token, um, because of the ONS thing, then any money we do get makes it difficult for us to use that strategically. So it's, it's a plea it's to say that if, if, if the Scottish Government or the Parliament wants the colleges to realise the potential they have for promoting Scotland abroad and not just making money for the sector, then you need to work with us. And especially the civil servants that are in the, um, the relevant directorate. Um, as I said, the ones who work for the universities work very closely with them. We don't enjoy that relationship. I've got George and then Emma and Shona. Thank you. I would want to absolutely reinforce the importance of an international dynamic within the curriculum for Scottish students. Um, we've been developing this over a couple of years now, and by next academic year there will be an international facet and opportunity within almost every programme across the college. Uh, with a significant number of students having the opportunity to travel, study and work abroad. That ranges from our motor vehicle students spending time working in Sweden mm -hmm. to a project we're building in Morocco at the moment, working with very disadvantaged street children, I think, might be the most appropriate term. However, while that's had a very positive impact on our students within West Lothian, and in some cases within the life skills development of young people who'd been really quite alienated from education. Um, it's difficult to sustain or to mainstream within the current funding arrangements because almost everything that we are doing is being supported by short-term funding applications through Erasmus would be our largest funder. 
Um, in an ideal world, I think we would be building that excellence into the curriculum on a much more sustainable and mainstreamed basis. But at the moment, it's very difficult to plan beyond an 18-month or two-year cycle. And curriculums need to be founded on principles that are more sustainable than that. Um, so I would echo what Dougal said about the voice of the Colleges of Scotland being heard. And also the comments you've made, Margaret, about the sustainability of funding arrangements, which is actually inhibiting development of an excellent curriculum. Okay, thanks. Thanks, George. Emma? Yes, um, I think by now the committee will have a, a very clear impression from the comments that uh, international work is taking place across the college sector, that we have gone through a period of real change with regionalisation, uh, changes to the ONS reclassification and also the immigration challenges, but that the work is very much continuing. And I wanted to pick up on the point about the partnership working, particularly with the higher education sector, that that's, that is definitely taking place. And I think now that actually there are less colleges in Scotland because we've regionalised and we've merged, it's more straightforward in a way for some of the universities to engage with the colleges. Um, and they, they absolutely want to do that and that the partnership working is taking place. And there are two examples I could offer from Edinburgh College. Uh, one is with Harriet Watt University, where we're working together in Panama, um, delivering teacher training. Another is with Edinburgh Napier University, where we're welcoming Saudi-sponsored students uh, to train up in English and then progress to engineering courses. Those two opportunities would not have been possible either for the college or the universities if we hadn't worked together in partnership. So there's, there's huge potential for an education sector in Scotland that brings the colleges, the universities and the schools um, where applicable together to present a united front of this is Scotland, we are open for business internationally in education. And to this end, there are actually other kinds of fora that are taking place. We have the International Directors Forum, which brings together um, heads of international functions at colleges, at universities. It involves the British Council, SDI. It's just an informal meeting, but it's actually been very productive to bring together different participants from the education sector or those who have an interest in the education sector and exporting it internationally. Sure. I would just like to uh, support Dougald and Wascop's uh, comments and the, the, the lack of a, a clear and focused approach at a strategic level. I think um, I, I would support what you say that when you look at the Northern Irish model and the collaborative working that takes place there, um, they understand that you know the smart exploitation of funding and, and European activities and European programmes um, can reap more sustainable benefits and can lead on to naturally lead on to commercial opportunities uh, for students um, and some of the, the, the evidence submitted it appeared that the, the kind of starting point for internationalization was international student recruitment commercial activities and and kind of sporadically focused you know kind of just chasing grants and, and money it needs to be far more strategically aligned um, to benefit as, as a sector uh, working collaboratively OK, I think we're moving on to one of my other colleagues in the committee, Rod Campbell. Yeah. I just wanted to, to pick up um, the theme and that, that Diggle was uh, talking about earlier on, about false distinction between EU and international, and also tag it back to kind of issues with uh, uh, the post-study work visa. But looking at the figures that College Scotland provided, there has been a 75% reduction in students and colleges from the EU from the period 2009-10 to 2013-14. In actual fact, the number of international students is only down 23%. Um, perhaps that, the, the panel could just expand on, on this issue of kind of um, EU versus international. Do they agree with Dougal that it's a false distinction? We'll just expand that one a bit further. And a second point, which I'm not sure that anyone can answer, it came from College Scotland, it's part of the framework is that colleges are requested to provide a copy uh, to Colleges Scotland of their international development strategy. I, I don't know if you've all provided it and uh, whether you could comment on whether, to your knowledge, other colleges have followed suit. that was provided. Um, I really believe that the EU number will be undercounted uh, because EU students are classed as home students 
within our record systems because that's how they are treated. They are treated exactly for feeing, for um, curriculum purposes. They are classed as home students. So it is probably a glitch in the data gathering rather than a, a true picture because um, we have seen an incredible number of students from EU. The, the, the market that is totally underrepresented in our uh, student body is from the rest of the UK because currently we do discriminate against them. Um, we do charge commercial fees for English and Northern Irish students and Welsh students. Um, but if you live in France, you will be treated as a home student, and that's just a quirk of our funding arrangements. Um, so I, I, I don't think we have suffered a 75% reduction, and I'm sure Colleges Scotland would provide um, better data uh, given, given that insight. Um, I would... I would like, if I can, um, to just cover off a, a couple of, of points. Um, we, ha we are struggling to retain all the international activity that we have generated um, and to look for new markets. Um, we are currently um, deeply involved in partnership arrangements with four Chinese universities, mainly in engineering. Um, and we have, this was where the dual degree came about. Um, it's not a university degree. We have been paying money to develop it because we've been developing it from Perth College um, as part of our strange arrangement within uh, the Highlands and Islands. Um, so it is the college sector. I, we, I wasn't aware that we could get Erasmus Plus funding for that, but I'll certainly uh, be asking how to do that because it is costing us dearly. Um, we have currently 56 Chinese students who have just undertaken their final exams for year three of our degree in mechanical and electrical engineering. We've been teaching them in country. We know that their English language needs to be uh, much improved, although they do study English from primary school in China. Um, it's obviously written because that's their teaching style, and when it comes to conversational English, it's absolutely hopeless, never mind technical uh, conversational English. So we know we've learned lessons from this year. We've got a pipeline um, at four universities. Uh, we have 100 students recruited in one university, um, who will be going on to their year three in 15-16. Only a, a minor proportion of those will come to us for their year four, for their honours year. We're restricting that number. They want to send us more, but we are concerned about our capacity to service that demand because we don't want to be overwhelmed and we don't want to take our good resources away from our home students in order to satisfy these international students. So we can't do everything. Um, we want to do everything, but we merely can't. So out of these 56 who we will be um, having a University of the Highlands and Islands graduation ceremony in deepest China in September uh, for our 56 graduates, um, of a Scottish degree, I, only about 10 of those will come to us for their year four honours. I, we can increase that. It's our limit that we've imposed. I, China is not in the same situation as our Indian market is. The Chinese are a wealthy nation. They invest heavily in their one child. Um, the post-study visa would certainly <coughs> help uh, in that respect, but it doesn't damage as much the Chinese market, and hence our strategy to change focus from India to China. Um, on the UKVI restriction, just a final point, the, the 46 Libyan engineers who have been specifically selected by the AAA government um, for um, our training our two years training in order to make them licensed engineers under the CAA. So I don't know what's more vocational than that. Um, 
we need to get them through the visa process, it will be very difficult. Uh, they have to go to Tunisia in order to go through the visa process, so we have to get them out of Libya and into Tunisia. Um, they will be screened in Tunisia, um, and we are at risk with these 46 of re a negatively impacting on our highly trusted status. If 46 are refused visas, we will lose our highly trusted status. That's a big business risk for a business that is wholly international focused. So what we're doing is we're putting a pathfinder group of three through the process. Because if three fail, we'll still retain our highly trusted status. The Libyan government don't understand why we're only putting three through. They think that there's a subplot and we only really want three. We don't want 46. And we're trying to reassure them that it's the visa process and everything will be fine. So they're going with that. So we're currently testing the water with three. Um, and hopefully those three, because they have the support of both governments, um, they haven't just been picked off the street. They've been specifically screened. Um, we hope that they will get through that visa control. If the three get through and they end up in Perth and living in Dundee, there'll be celebrations because that means that the remaining 43 will then proceed. So we also have 40 pilots who are waiting in the wings, no, not the flying wings, but the wings, to go through that same process. So any help that this committee can give for that specific difficulty that we're experiencing, but also to um, impact on our UKVI highly trusted status um, and, and how we can protect that in a very business-like manner and not in an immigration policed manner, um, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Emma. Very quick answer to the question about the strategies. Um, I think a number of international strategies were pre presented uh, as evidence for the committee. Um, so hopefully that answers the question that there are colleges who have developed uh, an international strategy which will have been endorsed by our boards of management, uh, our senior management team, and which will feed off the main college strategy which encompasses all areas of the college operations. Yeah, no, what I was getting at was how universal it was. I wasn't... I obviously accept that colleges here have done so, but whether that was actually standard across the board. But I think, I think it will depend on where the colleges are, the individual colleges are, in terms of its regionalisation process. For some colleges, it will be much more recent, that process, and probably they will lead, if, if it's the same as, as at our college, they'll lead with their main college strategy first and then develop the underpinning strategies for the curriculum, for the estates and for international. So it may be why there are not international strategies for every every college that has now regionalised in Scotland. But equally, some of the colleges may not engage in international activity for some of the reasons that we've discussed. Others uh, will absolutely be pressing forward with international work. OK, but Willie, coffee. <coughs> Thanks very much, convener. Um, there's a couple of clear messages that I'm taking from listening to colleagues around the table. One is the clear willingness for the college sector in Scotland to engage internationally and to attract students to Scotland and so on and so forth. And second is obviously the clear barriers that many of you have dis described, uh, which appear to me to be more political than strategic. Uh, I think that's obvious uh, where, the, where the problems lie. Uh, so therein lies an opportunity, given that there is a new government in the UK and we should make the most of that, I think, and this is the time, perhaps, to strike. Uh, you'll know that the Scottish Government's position on the post-study work visa and so on and so forth, and this reclassification issue that's affected the college finances has been very clear. How does the, has the college sector, will the college sector, act as one in support of those aims and perhaps try to make direct representation to the UK government, because you'll be, you'll be fully supported not only by the Scottish government, by a whole host of 
new MPs that you have in this country to assist that practice, because I think it's a golden opportunity, as Dougal described, and we mustn't miss out on this. Yeah, Margaret, we are really bumping up against time, so if yeah. you can have sort of a quick short. answers. Yeah. Yeah, the short answer to that is through our College of Scotland um, overarching agency. We'll take that forward um, as part of that board activity, but also um, the subcommittee of the Corporate Affairs Committee within College of Scotland. So that's where we will have the united voice. And uh, there's some representatives in the audience here today from College of Scotland, and I'm sure they're taking note to lobby that heavily. We'll look forward to hearing from them then. <laughs> Is there any other questions or comments around the table? Yeah, sure. There was, there was two things. Jane. One was, is there? Um, would you agree that because of the fact we we we, do, we have a reduction in overseas students, that that perhaps has compounded on the position in terms of subjects that we can offer? That's one question. The other question. If it's, it's not really a question, but a comment about um, the list you've made about the the strategy. I, I, I think I would I, I, that makes sense to me that we do need a national strategy. Yes, colleges have their own strategies, and that's fine and good. But I think nationally we need a strategy as well to support you in the work that you do do. But uh, going back to my um, uh, question about subjects. And there's been a lot of criticism of lack of subjects, and I think perhaps one of the reasons could be that we've lost a lot of OC students, which would have normally have helped us retain them. Margaret. Can I answer that? I, we have found that we don't have a brand abroad, and we don't have a league table. It's this identity crisis of what is the college sector um, in the international uh, arena. And what we have found is the best form of attack is being very focused and leading with niche products. So it's not leading with the whole lot of what we can do. Working for your college in particular, no, now I'm talking about Scottish wide. No, it's Scottish wide because what I've heard from a colleague from Fourth Valley is that they are homing in on oil and gas. We are homing in on aircraft engineering. And music and creative industries is another thing that we are selling abroad. So I think rather than going with the whole shop window uh, and confusing the market because they don't see the difference between the college sector and the university sector abroad, and that's understandable, um, I think the simpler the message we can make it, the better. So it's not about reducing the subjects that we are offering because of any uh, negative reason. It's a positive reason because you can focus attention and you can sell and market very particular niche products that are attractive to an international market. And that's what we're doing. So you wouldn't agree that the reduction in subjects is a result of lack of students. The reduction in subjects, do you yeah. mean the reduction in subjects offered by the colleges yes. as a whole? Yes. I don't think there has been a reduction in subjects. Well, no, you, you obviously don't live in Scotland then. Emma? Yeah, I, I don't feel there's a reduction in subjects. I think the, the international marketplace changes. There are subjects that are popular at very particular points in time. There are subjects that remain constantly popular, like English language, for example, which we're hugely well-placed to offer in Scotland. Um, and I think, in fact, for <clears throat> some of the colleges who've, who've merged, perhaps, we have more to offer because we become bigger colleges with more subjects. I think what has changed is the number of students coming from specific countries into Scotland because, as I mentioned earlier, some markets now become high-risk. And I think the colleges, to some of the examples that have been quoted already, India, Libya, etc., um, it makes it more difficult for us to recruit students from particular countries because it's going to be so much more difficult for them to get their visa. So I see the difference being largely perhaps around the countries that are flowing through to the colleges. Um, whether that's represented yet in any form of statistical data is probably quite difficult to say, but that's certainly, that's certainly my impression. Dougal. Points and subjects. Um, I should imagine that we, should, we need to do some research to see whether or not there has been an impact on the viability of certain courses. It's referring back some time ago, but you know when I, when I was responsible for international education in the college that had more international students than any 
it was absolutely clear that those international students kept some subjects viable. So I would be astonished if that's not the case, and I think we should do some research on that. But on the subjects, there's one really important point that we can't talk about today because we don't have enough time. There's a lot of the stuff we've talked about is people coming in here. We need to do more to internationalise the experience for our students, and the one area where we're sadly lacking is languages. The la languages education is almost dead in the sector, and we need to revive that. It's almost dead. If you look at the College of the... Well, it's not there. Okay. Andrew. Just very quickly, um, it's just something that Emma's mentioned, um, these um, riskier markets, um, and I'm going to put out a couple there, um, just from my experience, and they might be the likes of Pakistan or India. Um, although they're risky for um, colleges, and no doubt they are risky for universities as well, the university sector is still pulling, pulling in a, a large amount in numbers, uh, student recruitment numbers from these markets. Um, and I'm just wondering whether or not there might be some support to, to look at Emma's suggestion there about the causal link between, you know, what is riskier for a college, why is it riskier for a college in terms of UKVI and perhaps less riskier at higher education level. Um, and that, that would be a, a challenge I would lay down to the committee to perhaps look at research around that area, how we can actually pinpoint, um, well, in actual fact, there is a you know, that's a so-called riskier um, element towards the college sector, as opposed to the um, as opposed to the higher education. Although they are they are essentially working in the same market or trying to pull students from that same market. I see a lot of your colleagues' heads nodding. Anne, I would just like to say I don't see a deduction in, in subjects either. Um, but what I, I will say is that um, the Dundee College and the universities did a little bit of research to try and understand. Um, why we weren't getting as many international students in, in some areas. And what we found was that the, the country that was coming up that was, had the best um, recruitment was Australia. And the model that they actually used, whether it's, it's correct or not, but what we were cited back was that they were selling the extra activity around once they had actually graduated and they had received their qualification, they were able to stay and work for a further two years. They were given a green card. So that was not to say that the qualification was any better, the experience was any better, but that end, being able to add on that extra two years to stay and work, not you have to get out of the country, was seen as a positive that we were facing. Okay. Thank, you, thank you very much. Jimmy, we're okay. over time on this, so if you've got a really oh, quick question. pretty quick, <laughs> this. Um, it's just that Colleges Scotland told the committee that this framework for the future of internationalisation yeah. for the college sector was published in 2014. Yeah. I was looking at the international stra strategy for the Edinburgh College, mm -hmm. and it appears to be very optimistic, and, and it says by 2018 we will do certain things, and it's a very optimistic strategy. Is that based on the framework, or is that your own strategy? Uh, and, and, and what do you think is the best strategy? What, <laughs> because we've had several different strategies, as far as I can see. Um, our strategy was actually developed off the college's main strategic plan. So it was, it was developed off that first, before the College of Scotland strategy that you refer to was actually published. Um, because we wanted to have, as we had an active portfolio of international work, we wanted to have a strategy ready as a merged college that we could give to stakeholders and say that we are actively working internationally. I think in terms of which strategy is, is right or which we use, I think every individual institution will have their own strategy. You'll see that in the college and the university sector, but they will work to overarching uh, initiatives or overarching strategies, whether it's at a College of Scotland level, national level, or a UK-wide level. Um, so I think we'll be working at, at different levels according to the, to the type, the context that we're actually operating in. Okay. Thanks. As you can see, we could probably spend all morning um, uh, discussing all of these aspects, but we do have a second panel in relation to this uh, in, inquiry this morning. Can I thank you all very, very much for your time here, for your contributions here, for your written contributions, and should you have any more contributions, please uh, uh, bring them to us. We're very interested in what you've got, got to say, and I think we've heard your clear messages 
very, very loud and clear today, and they'll certainly um, form some of our information going back to the government, as I suspect, <laughs> very strongly. But thank you very much. I'm going to suspend briefly to allow our witnesses to change chairs and for a very, very quick comfort break, should you need it. Thank you. That's
Uh, welcome back to the European and External Relations Committee. We are continuing with our work Thank this you. morning on Agenda Item 2 with our inquiry on Connecting Scotland. And we have a number of uh, witnesses from the third sector and civic society this morning who, uh, I believe, managed to listen to some of the uh, issues raised by the colleges sector in the earlier session. Um, again, if I just go round the table uh, to allow uh, people to introduce themselves, I'm Christina McKelvey, the M uh, MSP for Hamilton, Larkhall Stonehouse and Convener of the Committee. I'm Hansel Malik, West Commissioner, and from MSP from Glasgow. I'm Willie Coffey, MSP Kilmarnock, Northern Valley. Uh, I'm Gordon Adam. I'm Director of Development and Communications at the Royal Society of Edinburgh. I'm Roderick Campbell, MSP for North East Fife, and for the official report, I'm also a member of Amnesty International. I'm Peter Kelly. I'm Director of the Poverty Lines and also Vice President of the European Anti-Poverty Network. Hi, I'm Ali Cairns. I am Head of European Affairs for SCVO. Um, I'm also on the board of our European Network of National Associations. Good morning. I'm David Hope-Jones. I'm the Principal Officer of the Scotland-Malawi Partnership. Uh, Jamie McGregor, MSP Highlands and Islands. I'm Julie Hepburn. I cover Advocacy and Education for Amnesty International in Scotland. Uh, good morning. I'm Bruce Edmondson. I'm the Legal Officer at the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. You've managed to, uh, we've managed to cover all of Scotland this morning. The colleges, and now it looks like we're going to cover most of the world um, in this session. So, uh, welcome to to, to committee. Um, I wonder if anybody's got any sort of a, you know points they would like to raise uh, immediately at the start of the committee. Um, will we go straight to questions, Jamie? Have you got questions ready to go? Yeah. A question on human rights. Right, you knock yourself out. Um, I, I was doing a, 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 trying to. Um, involved in a case the other day of a dairy farmer uh, and uh, with his human rights he, he, he considered that his um, quote had been taken away but he couldn't get a lawyer in Scotland uh, to represent him and the point about this was it seemed to me pretty pointless uh, if, with human rights if, if you couldn't and he, he could only get a lawyer if he gave £25,000 in advance um, and I'd just like a comment on that, uh, because it seems to me that human rights are only human rights if you can uh, uh, access them. And if you can't access them through, through a lawyer, uh, you know, what's the point? Bruce, have you got any way of enlightening this situation? <laughs> yes. <laughs> he says confidently. Um, I, I, I think uh, Mr McGregor has... Um, uh, focused on a very key issue in terms of human rights, in terms of access to justice. The issue of, of milk quotas itself is, is one that um, has come before the Parliament and the, the Public Petitions Committee before. It's something that, um, that the, the Commission has, has commented on. Um, I, I won't at this stage comment on the, on the individual case, but, no. but the wider point in terms of access to justice is the requirement for, for the state is to set up a framework, a legal framework, to ensure that people can access to justice and get a remedy for um, breaches to, to their, their human rights. And the system that we have developed in Scotland is through the, the legal system and um, with the availability of legal aid for, for those that, that, that can't afford it. I think it's, it's no surprise to anyone that that, that needs um, further consideration. Um, it also goes to, to a wider point in terms of, of legal education um, and in terms of the way in which we provide for, for remedies through, through the court system and also alternative dispute resolution. Um, I think that there's uh, significant work to be done on, on each of the, these aspects. Um, in terms of, of legal education, uh, it's not a, a unique experience, I think, for, for the, the constituent that you spoke to, to not be able to, to find a lawyer who will, will take on their, their case. And I think that the, the legal community needs to do more to improve legal education in Scotland. There are some very um, good programs happening at, at the European and at the international level on, on legal training. Um, and it's one of the things that, that the Commission is, is keen to, to develop further. And it links to some of the things that some of the um, witnesses in the previous session were saying in terms of we could improve on our accessing kind of expertise internationally and bringing them back back home to Scotland. I think I think there's there's a real gap there that we need to fill. Um, in terms in terms of access to legal aid and to and to the ability to access justice, um, I, th I think that that there's there's real concerns there about the the um, cuts to legal aid limiting people's ability to to access 
justice. Um, and I think that there's also scope to look at um, alternative ways of um, resolving disputes. I think all of these things um, form part of the solution. Chair, can I actually ask a follow-up? I didn't understand that, to be, I have to be honest. I mean, um, I thought that Jamie's question, maybe I've picked you up wrong, Jamie. Jamie's question is, is, is there's an individual who wishes to pursue uh, a legal end because he feels that his human rights have been infringed upon. Lawyers are not willing to take the case on unless they pay a hefty fee, which means, oh. and, if they're, and if they're not able to do that, how did that individual get justice uh, in terms of his human rights? Um, am I right, Jamie, with that? Is that's that the, Yeah, exactly. I yes. thought that was your question. It is. But I didn't get an answer for that. And could you perhaps make it a bit clearer so I can actually understand? I know you probably come from a legal background, but I'm a, lay, I'm a lay person. So if you could maybe explain to me how this individual could actually get justice. Okay, I, I apologize that I, that, that no, I, that no, I wasn't no, clear. Fault. I'm sure it's my fault. No, no, not at all. Um, the system that we have in, in Scotland is that the individual, um, if they have an action, particularly so that the, the, the instance that we're talking about is, relates to, to respect for, for property rights. And, and so in relation to, to milk quotas, my understanding being that feel that their, their property rights have been infringed by restrictions on them, them selling this, this interest that they have. Um, the system that we have in Scotland is that they should be able to go um, to the courts to seek justice for that, and the legal profession should be able to provide support for them to do that. So far. Yep. Um, and the, the state is required to ensure that access to justice is provided, and one of the ways in which the state has said that it does that is by providing legal aid for those that, that can't afford it. Um, that is challenging because... Uh, legal aid's not, not always available. And so particularly when we're talking about a civil case, particularly when we're talking about recovery of, of money, it, it is a problem that um, lawyers are in the profession of, of making money as well. And, um, and I won't speak for, for individual lawyers and the decisions that they, that they make. It's difficult for yeah. me now. Yeah. Okay. Um, but but they, they, the, the lawyers that were approached obviously took the decision that they weren't able to take, take the case forward or that they needed um, upfront, upfront funding for That's it. Funny, yeah. Um, my point was that um, one of the challenges is that there are not enough lawyers in Scotland who are trained in human rights issues. Um, so the pool of people that you can go to to ask them to take on your case is smaller than it should be. And so I think that we can do a lot in terms of improving legal education to improve the understanding that, of human rights that lawyers have, which would allow individuals to approach more lawyers than, than they currently can. Currently, there's very few lawyers that take on that type of case. So that's one of the points that I was making. Um, in terms of whether legal aid would be appropriate here, I, I wouldn't want to, to comment on that. I think you still haven't actually answered the question. Maybe you don't know the answer, I don't know. Because the question is, how does this individual then get justice in terms of protecting his human rights? And, and I think that's what we're trying to find out. I mean, would you agree with me? Yes, yes, as well. Uh, because that seemed to me you know, uh, the key, uh, rather a crux of the whole thing, in a way. Indeed. That it's all very well saying you've got these things, uh, but if you can't access them, then, um, then, then, what then happens? it's like a catch-22. Yeah. Do you it, think it, another aspect of this that would maybe help inform... To, to be honest, it's not our area of expertise, the, the domestic uh, legal side, but just to, to, to echo, people have you know, said that to us in the past quite a lot. It's, it's about access to justice and speaking to various lawyers. There's a, there's a great expectation that actually people will take on human rights cases for free. Um, just because for the, you know, for the greater good for the principle of it. And so you do get a lot of lawyers who are working on human rights cases who end up having to do a lot of work for free, and they do it because they believe in it. But th that, is, that is the crux of it. There aren't enough people to take on those human rights cases at a reasonable cost or to have those costs covered. Is there a register or a list or anything of uh, practising human rights lawyers in Scotland? Uh, the Law Society does, does, does keep, keep a list. Um, Another point that I would make briefly, though, is that, um, that in order to, to best protect, um, protect human rights, we need good law, policy, and, and, and practice in place. By the time you get to, to needing a lawyer, something's gone wrong. And, and particularly when we're look, looking at, at the place that we're in now and the, the um, legislative competence of, of, of this parliament and, and also of the government, is that there's a requirement to put in place laws that 
and protect people's human rights. And so we need the legal framework in place. And there's a lot of positive things that we get, can be done to ensure that people don't end up in a situation where they uh, are forced to, to go to the courts to, to enforce their rights. But there is a problem when you do get to that stage with some types of cases in particular. Rod, what else declaring an interest would you like to enlighten us to? <laughs> as a member of the Faculty of Advocates and also as a member of the Justice Committee, but obviously alternative ways of funding um, disputes is something that kind of this Parliament and Justice Committee and others um, have been looking at. Um, so it's a kind of involved issue to develop um, for this session. Um, the, the, the central point is there, obviously, and if you, if you can't actually access your human rights, then it's of uh, uh, lesser value. So, uh. OK, can I maybe uh, shift, shift and, back and to sorry, the agenda? <laughs> asking the question, but it was something that, that you yeah. know, I felt I had to ask. Yeah, yeah, well, there's, there's a whole aspect to international engagement that involves human rights as well. But one of the questions I wanted to ask the, the witnesses around the table this morning was, you know, how, how do you take forward your international engagement? How, you know, do you work together on it? Is there specific aspects of it you would work with, or is there discrete aspects that you do as the, the individual groups that, that you are? And I'm happy to just catch the eye, and I've caught your eye. Uh, yes, um, <laughs> just talking about what we do, we do work with um, other organisations. Um, the Royal Society of Edinburgh recently became uh, a member of Connected Scotland, which is a group of eight organisations who are working together to promote the best practice in higher education in Scotland internationally. Um, those eight organisations are ourselves, British Council Scotland, University Scotland, Scottish Funding Council, Scottish Government, and the three enterprise bodies, Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, and SDI. So we are working together to promote international higher education. We've got three priority countries as part of that, which are China, Brazil, and Malaysia. And we're currently looking at things that we can do with those three countries. The, uh, the Royal Society of Edinburgh in particular um, has very strong relations in China. We actually have a memoranda of understanding with the four main learned societies, Chinese Academy of Sciences, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, I'm, a lot of names I'm giving you here, but uh, uh, Chinese Academy of Engineering and the Chinese uh, um, National uh, Natural Science Foundation of China. Um, and in fact, we have the uh, president of the Chinese Academy of Sciences coming Tomorrow, he's going to be admitted as an honorary fellow of the RSC, and he's also going to meet with the First Minister as well in Glasgow. So we are, we are working within our own area, where the countries that we have memorandum of understanding, but we're also working in partnership with uh, other organisations too. So we do both, is the simple answer. Peter. Um, I, th I think probably like most of the other organisations around here, we connect when, when we need to. Obviously, our main focus is around um, poverty, and our main international focus is on European policy. So we work through the, the European Anti-Poverty Network at the, the UK level, but also um, with our colleagues right across Europe. But I think in, in Scotland, we've worked with SEVO in the past around um, some European issues, and we've worked with them around ESF and about the development of the the next programme for ESF. Uh, we, we've connected with organisations when we need to. We're starting to do more work with, uh, with NIDOS, the Network of International Development Organisations in Scotland. So, so we're making connections where we can, but I think the, the point that we made in the, the written evidence is that sometimes the, um, the European policy issues can seem very remote, um, and so so it's, it's a challenge not only to work with other organisations, but to work with their own members. Um, they want us to work on those issues that seem most directly relevant. So we, we sometimes, and this being quite honest, we sometimes have a job um, convincing organisations that European policy is important. We believe that it is, and we, we can demonstrate that over and over again. I think in the, the period that we've got coming up over the next two years, then many of our organisations will come to discover that European policy is quite important as we have a, a discussion around a, an upcoming referendum. We had an event last week that involved NIDOS and we've seen, um, which I was very pleased to, mm. to, to launch in Lanarkshire, the Scotland versus Poverty Programme, which yeah. you've been very, very well, well involved in. So we, we've got some of that excellent information. Ali. 
Hi, uh, well thanks very much for having us today. Um, it's actually great to be talking about this and I, you know, I think we'd probably all like to, to, to talk more about it and hopefully we'll continue to do so. Um, I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, for SCVO, um, in the past, a lot of our European work has been sort of filtered through you know, domestic arrangements and focused around the European structural funds and opportunities around that. Um, we've always had um, connections to our, our international organisation, Civicus, which is a, an international alliance of civil society organisations. Um, mm. But our ability to sort of you know, engage and, and do work at that level has been, has been difficult. Um, in term, we have a, a much sort of greater focus on um, Europe and, and going forward, we're going to have uh, more of a greater focus uh, on Europe. We are involved in a network called ENA, which is a network of SCVOs, to make it easy to understand, which is the na national umbrella bodies within all the EU countries. Um, and we're up to about 23 members out of uh, 21 quant uh, countries, And because one of our members is a, 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 a big umbrella over the Balkans, so it covers a, a quite a few countries. Um, and we... In that network, we have an office in Brussels and we have a couple of staff that um, have, and again, we've sort of struggled with capacity. We put a membership-based um, network um, and we have accessed bits of money from the Commission to try and um, strengthen that network so that it can benefit not just the SCVOs, but it can benefit our members. And we've really gone through sort of ups and downs with that. But the primary goal of that, for all of us, um, you know, my colleagues across Europe, has been to do more of what Peter has said, is to strengthen our ability to engage and influence policy at a European level, for us to have greater connections to the Parliament, to um, the Commission, to uh, funding opportunities and all sorts of things. Um, similar to, I guess, have the same capacity that you know commercial organizations and other things have within Europe to, to do their business you know civil society would like to have that same uh, ability to do that but equally um, a big part of the work that we do with our, our colleagues across Europe is around participation and we all have similar values in terms of the, our, our approach to democracies in Europe um, and the, the participating in democracy is a very strong element of the work that we do. So not only are we trying to strengthen each other's networks and begin to influence things at a policy level, but there is a changing um, discourse within um, the European Union around growth being inclusive, um, how, what social policies um, need to grow at the same rate as economic policies. And there is a a bit of attention and focus shifting to civil society in terms of solutions. Um, so we've got a window of opportunity in terms of, for us for collaborating. But one of the things which, you know, SCVO we're very uh, conscious of is that there are lots of opportunities transnationally. Not just to collaborate, to share and to learn, um, but there's funding opportunities that Scottish organisations are missing out on because we have not got the focus and the attention, the capacity to grasp them and just be on the front foot for doing that. So um, as an organisation, we've just recently, we're going through our new th uh, three-year strategic plan and we are very much bringing Europe right up to the top of the agenda so that we can open up, find uh, transnational opportunities for all our members and the rest of the sector um, and uh, for organisations that we work with across Europe to begin to partner with, with Scottish organisations because we all know the benefits that that brings. And also just to try and mobilise some of the things that bind us together that we want to change within Europe and, and obviously organisations like Peter's and Julie's there are some very key things that are going to come into focus um, are very much in focus and we're not geared up enough to challenge them. We had a lovely visit from some of your European partners last we did. week. We did, we indeed. did. Um, David, if you would give us a wee insight into what your organisation does, but for the matter of the record, I have been involved with the Scottish-Malawi partnership too. 
thanks very much. Um, so yes, I'm from the Scotland Malawi partnership with the National Umbrella Agency that exists to coordinate, represent and support the civic links between Scotland and Malawi. More than 94,000 Scots have an active link with uh, Malawi each year. 46% of Scots have a friend or family member with some sort of connection to Malawi and more than 300,000 Scots benefit from those connections with Malawi. We're a large and diverse network um, composed of uh, every university in Scotland, half the local authorities, um, 153 schools, um, primary and secondary, and hundreds of churches, charities, community groups, diaspora groups, all engaged in this civic effort that goes back 156 years to the travels of, of Dr. David Livingston. In answer to your question, absolutely, collaboration and connections are absolutely crucial. And I think, actually, it's something Scotland does quite well. It's often said there's less egos and logos in Scotland, and I absolutely agree. It's easier to build those sort of collaborations. We saw it uh, with the Make Poverty History campaign some time ago, more recently the Enough Food um, for Everyone If campaign. Our network, I think, um, links in very well with, with NIDOS, who I work very closely with on a day-to-day -day basis, but also the Scottish Fair Trade Forum, um, ideas looking at development, education and global citizenship in schools and, and SCVO as well. I guess the key point I want to make as far as um, uh, Scotland's work internationally is valuing the, the role of, of civic society. It's fantastic that we have these, that we have these networks, that we have these strong organisations. But the most special thing about what Sc Scotland does internationally, I think, is what the people of Scotland do um, with their own time, with their own energy. And we exist as a network to harness that experience, that enthusiasm uh, and that expertise. Just with regard to the very first question that was that was asked, I could uh, recount a couple of fantastic links between Scotland and Malawi about in the faculty of, of advocates, um, the SRUC helping increase um, productivity and dairy uh, herding in, in Malawi. Really, almost all aspects of civic society have some sort of connection between the two country uh, between the two countries. But I think what's really special is that um, people to people endeavour and I think it's really important as this committee looks to capture what Scotland does internationally that we don't forget that actually it's, it's the people of Scotland giving up their time that really makes this stand out. For the last seven years I've been saying I don't know of any comparable north-south civic uh, bilateral relationship and no one's, no one's ever corrected me. Almost every month that I do this job, I'm contacted by ambassadors, honorary consuls, and asked, how did Scotland develop that relationship with, with Malawi? It's, I think, the, the envy of many countries across the world. I think it's being emulated across the world. And as long as we keep focused on that as a dignified two-way partnership, actually, it's something we should be rightly proud of. Well, maybe it was prominence that we were here today in the David Livingston room to do to do this this session and and I think you're absolutely right I had a visit to, to Malawi a few years ago with the Westminster Foundation for Democracy to work with women's groups and other groups um, to stand for their next year's elections and um, every primary school I went into the children could tell me things about David Livingston uh, and about Scotland and you know their, their education system was very familiar there was lots of things that were very 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 familiar but you know a very very warm country and um, the influences that they've had on Scotland and that we've had on them has just been absolutely tremendous. So the work that you do to continue that is just uh, um, it's something that I will always support. So that's for the record <laughs> as well. Julie, do you want to give us a wee oversight in some of the things that, that Amnesty is involved in uh, internationally and how those connect with uh, some of the, the focus that we have, not just from political Scotland, but from civic Scotland too? Um, the, the clue is in the name, Amnesty International. Um, so it's a massive uh, global organisation that's involved at national level in over 70 countries. So as Amnesty Scotland, it's actually quite a challenge just to connect with the constituent parts of our own organisation. Um, Amnesty Scotland is part of Amnesty UK as well. So we're quite a small outpost of, of Amnesty uh, UK. So we spend a lot of time working within our own organisation, um, frankly, um, but we do work with other organisations on various issues. So we work with a number of organisations, for example, on the Arms Trade Treaty, um, very closely with, with Oxfam, for example. Um, we work closely with other organisations to lobby for things like you know, improvement to business and human <coughs> rights. So we work with organisations um, like SCIAF, who've done a lot of work in, in that regard. We work 
very closely with a number of organisations through SNAP, Scotland's National Action Plan for, for Human Rights. So there's a number of organisations from across Civic Scotland that are involved in that process. And SNAP itself is connected internationally, primarily through the, the Scottish Human Rights Commission as well. So there's those, those international links. And we also work very closely with the, the Scottish Government as well on our international agenda, advising through things like the International Human Rights Advisory Panel and through SNAP as well. We co-convene one of the, the SNAP action groups with the Scottish Human Rights Commission and the Scottish Government. So a lot of our focus is actually in trying to use our influence and our expertise to advise the Scottish Government on, on international uh, matters. And we spend a lot of time connecting within Amnesty International to bring that expertise to Scotland. Um, an example of that was in advance of the, the Commonwealth Games. We were asked... What are, what are going to be your main issues for the, the visiting sort of Commonwealth um, officials and, and politicians? So we spent a lot of time uh, speaking to colleagues around the world um, who've got the contacts on the ground to say, what are the main human rights concerns for you? And then we put that together in a monster briefing um, for the Scottish <coughs> Government and Scottish officials to help inform the strategy for sort of bilaterals and, and things around the, the, the Commonwealth games. So we spend a lot of time gathering evidence and channeling that through to Scottish kind of organisations, the government, through the Scottish Parliament as well. We spend a lot of time briefing MSPs on various issues. So the way I see it is very much we kind of harness amnesty and bring it to Scotland and try and highlight our campaigns and engage people in, in Scotland through that process. Yeah, thank you. Bruce, Scottish Human Rights Commission and SNAP. I, I was in, uh, involved with the Congress of Local Authorities and Regions in Europe, and last year they were very, very interested in SNAP because they seen Scotland as a beacon, almost, um, you know, and taking forward, you know, good human rights policy that actually worked on the ground, and you know that that was very, very well respected and very well received in Europe, and I think they're still looking. Uh, towards you for, for more of that inspiration but we know about that in Europe I mean, maybe you can give us some insight into what's happening you know in the wider world as well um, ab absolutely and it's, it's a great pleasure to, to, to hear those comments but also to, to hear the the comments that, that colleagues have made and it, it, um, it brings to mind a, a proverb from my home country New Zealand which is which means, if you ask me what's the most important thing in the world, I'll tell you three times. It's people, it's people, it's people. And I think that comes through very, very strongly, but with, with what, what all colleagues have said, is that, that Scotland does incredibly well on the international stage because of its people and because of its people's ability to make these, these connections and, and share best practice. Um, the, the Scottish Human Rights Commission, as is, 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 I'm sure you all know, was set up by, by this parliament in, in 2006, but the, the concept of national human rights institutions goes back to the earliest days of the United Nations, to, to 1946, when the, after the atrocities of the, the, the Second World War and the, the building of, of the international human rights framework, the Economic and Social Council of the UN said, we need another type of body, we need, we need local institutions that are able to, that are not state institutions, that are able to, to work on the ground and apply international standards domestically, but also to provide a bridge to the international framework and give us information at the international level. And so that's very much where, where the Scottish Human Rights Commission sits, along with 106 similar institutions across the world now, um, over 40 of those are in, are in Europe. And we work together in a number of ways, both to, to improve international standards globally, but also that bridging role of bringing those standards back. Um, and I think as, um, as Julie's mentioned, and, and you've mentioned yourself, Convener, the, the National Action Plan on Human Rights is, is, is one way where I think um, Scotland is, is, um, is leading the way. The, um, that's been recognised by the UN, also recognised within the Council of Europe, where the model's been promoted by, by the Commissioner for Human Rights the Council of Europe, and, and I've been trying to apply that, particularly in countries that are going through very difficult circumstances, like, like Ukraine at the moment. Um, our colleagues there are, are very look, looking very closely at the Scottish model. And what's different about the Scottish model um, for a national action plan? 
um, is the way in which it was developed, and it links very closely to what, to what Julie was saying. Um, the concept of having a national action plan has been around for a long time. It was discussed very, very extensively at the World Conference in, in Vienna on, on human rights in, in 1993, where all the countries of the world agreed that they would set out a, a comprehensive action plan for how they would deliver on their human rights obligations. In most countries around the world, that's been a, a government program, that the, the government's listed, this is what we're doing um, based on the recommendations given to us by the monitoring process. In Scotland, we did it a little bit differently in that um, we got civil society and government around the table, and we tried to, to reach out to, to the most marginalised people in Scotland, those that were really struggling to be heard, and create a really consultative process to come up with a negotiated um, plan that would then be monitored collectively. And so, it's, so it's that, that's the thing that's, that, that's a wee bit different, um, and that's the thing that the world's very, very interested in. Um, time doesn't allow to, to go into to, to all of that, um, but it, it's very much about making sure that, that, that people's lives are improved in really practical ways, making sure that our culture moves in a progressive way and, and that we develop a human rights culture, and that we have our international obligations, both in terms of reporting to the monitoring bodies, but also making sure that we apply things. Um, we bring, bring best practice back, um, and also that, that, that we live up to our international obligations and um, in terms of um, leading the way. And again, an example that Julie gave was the, the Commonwealth Games, where for the first time when the Commonwealth Games was, was held in Scotland, a human rights plan was, was, was attached to that in terms of the design of the games, in terms of the running of the games, and in terms of the outcome of the games. Um, also things like, like, like climate justice, where Scotland's really, really leading the way, a very, very important issue, uh, business and human rights, the rights of older people. These are all things where Scotland is very much part of the international development of best practice. Um, I could go on and on, but I'm aware of time, so I'll stop. Willie Coffey's got a question for you as well. Willie. Hey, well, I'm just there's such a bewildering array of, of good and positive messages from around the table. Quite a contrast, convener. The, the previous session was, was people with a similar focus on international engagement, and there's such a variety here, and it's difficult to know which one to pick up. I was really impressed with what Gordon was telling us from the Royal Society. My attention was drawn to, to Peter's comments too, and also Ali there. You were talking about engagement with the European Union and kind of civic society and, and so on and so forth and how you influence European policy and I, I, I was hoping to just pick up with you and ask you a wee bit more about that. Can you see your influence uh, within European Union policy development actually happening? Because it's a question we've raised at the committee on a number of occasions. How we best try to influence the European policy agenda through our elected members or through the Commission? Exactly how do you guys try to achieve that? It's not easy. It is a challenge. Um, we, the, the structure at the moment is that there is um, the European and Economic Social Committee, um, uh, which is one of the two committees, um, the, uh, the, uh, as well as the Commission within Europe. And on the ESC, um, there is a, a group that's dedicated to civil society. And every member state has a... a, a civil society representative on that committee. So we have one in Scotland that's um, just about to change, actually, and a, a previous colleague of yours, Irene Oldfather, is about to become the Scottish representative um, on the ESC for us. Now, the ESC, in terms of that's the, the, the structure that's in place at the moment, um, is, is possibly two things. It's maybe not empowered enough to hold um, th the Commission to account and to... Um, uh, begin to work on some reform, but also there is a, 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 a deficit between that representation role and the sector in Scotland, and we're going forward, going to try and be on the front foot and address work, address that a bit better, um, and empower Irene and with our colleagues across Europe to try and see if we can make the ESC a, a reform it in a way that it's more accountable to the to the sector and it's a more a mutual uh, process that goes on. So there is a body there that we that we can work through, but that's because that's not been been the best route for us. And as civil society, we tend to like to do things ourselves. Um, we have, as I mentioned earlier, our European network of SCVOs. Now that's been a bit of a slow burner because of uh, trying to resource it. And in terms of influence. We 
are beginning to work our way out around how you influence um, within the Commission. I would say we've got some way to go in terms of being able to have the capacity to work with the Parliament better um, and understand how that works. There are some very big, strong movements in Europe that are doing quite well on particular issues um, and are quite well organised. And uh, Peter's involved in, in one of them, which I'll let him chat about. Um, and, but how effective is the influence up to date has probably been reasonably minimal. And it's one of the things that we talked about last week. We held a conference here in Edinburgh with the ESC um, about on the Milan Declaration on EU policies, which has a focus on how civil society can engage and influence change and things within the European Union. And that's because of the pressure on European democracies around their welfare states and that needing to look for solutions elsewhere. Um, and there's a whole array of things that are happening throughout Europe in terms of welfare and the changes that are happening in welfare. And they're looking at the solutions coming from civil society. Now, there's quite a gap between that intention and, and how we get there. And for instance, if you take Italy, for example, large parts of um, health, whether it's maternity services, you know, are delivered by civil society. So it's how um, those solutions get the same attention and focus, all that you know, social innovation that's talked about gets the same attention and focus as you know, technology and commercial R&D innovation. So we're, I'm not sure I've probably gone a long way around to say that we're, we're not being particularly influential in terms of European policy, but we're trying to get on the front foot and collaborate with our colleagues across Europe um, to be better at that. Um, it's a big question. Uh, how influential have we been? I think the only way that organisations um, link the poverty lines, like a network like the poverty lines, can be influential is by working with others. And it's kind of as Ali has said, you know, we we work with um, 31 networks across Europe now, so going beyond uh, the boundaries of the EU. And it's only by working with those other networks with our organisation based in Brussels, which is absolutely crucial, there's no doubt about that, um, that we can have influence. And I think EAPN has been certainly in the past extremely influential. So the whole elements of the, the Lisbon strategy, I would say, are, are a result of the, um, the lobbying of particularly EAPN, but also the wider social platform in, in Brussels has made a real difference. And like you know, many organisations, civil society organisations that try to exert influence over policy development, sometimes that influence wanes. And I have to say in the last few years, as we've moved to the uh, Europe 2020 strategy, I think we've had less of a an influence over the way that those strategies have developed. But the important thing for us is still to be there and still to be discussing, particularly with the new um, president of the Commission, new president of the Parliament. EAPN has been fortunate to have meetings with uh, the cabinets of, of both of those. Um, I've been involved, so in that way we can we can have a direct influence in, in the way that some of the discussions are going. But I think we have to recognise that you know, this is this is part of a wider change within Europe. You know, there is there is um, a degree of disenchantment and um, disengagement with with European politics in many countries. We think we have a responsibility as a as a network of civil society organisations to try and promote that re-engagement. And so we work with the Commission, we'll work with political parties, we we'll work with anyone really to try and uh, engage with people. Um, or to provide ways to allow people to engage with uh, European policy and then for us to have an influence on that policy. Thank you for that. Can you now just let others in? Hans Ella. Uh, thank you. Um, like Willie, I mean, I, I'm, I am pleased with the work that you are doing. But um, I want to come back to our very first question today and to say that, you know, we here in Scotland have people who might be slipping through the net. And I'm, I'm, I would be really interested to see and hear what options you could offer 
people like those uh, because of, I mean, working in with uh, people in China, and I mean, I'm sure it's just as important. But um, I would want to see our own Scots getting um, justice as well, and that their human rights not inf infringed. Is there any advice or um, direction you can give us that we could pursue that angle as well? Um, well this afternoon, I'm going to uh, hop foot it through to Glasgow for a meeting of the SNAP co-conveners. And there are a number of action groups that, that have been set up as a result of SNAP. I think there are five. Um, so although we're on the one, you know, international obligations, mm -hmm. I think there is one that has a focus on, on justice as well and access to justice. So mm -hmm. it would be well worth giving that feedback to that SNAP action group as something mm -hmm. to take forward because a lot of domestic work now on human rights is happening through, my catchphrase, the prism of SNAP. Yes. This is the way to, to make progress, certainly from, from my observation. So I would contact um, the action group, the SNAP action group, and check that this is on their, their radar. I don't know if, Bruce, you know if you know it's on the, the agenda, but certainly it's, it is quite a, yeah. quite a sort of, you know, high profile issue that, that we've encountered in domestic sort of human rights agenda. Lack that's, of access to justice. That's very, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would, would, would you be able to send me the information? Yeah. That'd be fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah. David, did you want to come back in in the back of Willie's question? Yeah, just, just yeah. Very, very, very briefly. Um, we, as a network, are active, obviously, in, in this parliament in, in, in Westminster, and our colleagues in Malawi active in um, the Malawi parliament. Um, but there is uh, a few touch points that we have with, with, with Brussels as, as, as well. I want to give just one quick example. Um, two or three months ago during Scottish Fair Trade Forum, Charles Chavy, a smallholder sugarcane farmer, um, came across visiting um, Scotland. And one of the issues that he raised um, was coming from the EU. Um, the communities he worked with and represented had received a lot of um, support from the, the EU to develop their uh, capacity of growing sugarcane. But a change in uh, the rules, which I'll, I'll spare you the, the, the details of in 2017, means that it will be very hard, almost impossible, for those communities to actually import into the EU at all, and the UK is one of their major markets. Um, what we were able to do as a network, a civic network, was to write straight away to Scotland's six um, MEPs. Four of them, within a week, got back to me. I shan't name uh, who did and who didn't, um, but four of them got back to us and said, yeah, this is, this is something we would like to represent. Within a month, um, four letters had been written to significant individuals in, in Brussels, and a question had been asked in the European Parliament. I'm not going to kid on um, that we've been able to effect serious and substantial change, but I do think what we were able to do by having an effective network is to li listen seriously to those issues on the ground and communicate them effectively through to, to, to Brussels. I've remained in contact with, with Charles up in Mizuzu in the northern region of, of Malawi since, and he was absolutely gobsmacked that he could come to a, a meeting of civil society individuals, and because there's strong networks, that those issues were able to be um, uh, communicated to uh, the elected representatives, that those representatives felt a genuine pressure to report back on, on what they've done, and that those issues were taken forwards. Ours is a very small voice in, 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 in Brussels, but it was inspiring to see that we were able to use those networks to, to listen to the issues on the ground and to communicate them effectively even in the European Parliament. It's, it's maybe to follow up on David's point also to come back to um, Hanzala's question as well. I think it's important to emphasise that um, any lobbying work that civil society organisations do at, at the European level or beyond is, is not done for um, any other reason than to try and improve the position of people that we're working for in Scotland and the UK. Um, but I think, as Ali made the point very well earlier on, there is a question of wider solidarity with, um, for, in our case, with people who are living on low incomes across Europe. I think there is a, a shared um, destiny for, for many people across Europe. And I think that, that question of bringing the real voices to policymakers is something again that that allows us to have to exert influence over um, over European policy you'll know yourself you gave us a message of support last year when we sent a delegation of people with direct experience of poverty to to Europe to a major European meeting um, so I think it, it's important to to recognize that our, our efforts at the European level or, or internationally elsewhere is about bringing change 
to Scotland, it sometimes can seem very slow, and sometimes it is far too slow. Um, but that's that's the the key aim of the work that we do at that level. Yes, I just wanted to comment comment on our, our European context. Obviously, I've mentioned China is important for us, but Europe is very important too. Uh, the main basis of the work we do is the exchange of researchers and research through memorandum of understanding that we have. And we have 23 of those with uh, sister academies around the world. But uh, 11 of those are within Europe. So Europe remains a very important place for our work. Um, also, we are members of ALIA, which is uh, the All European Academies Network. And at the present moment, one of our fellows, um, uh, Graham Kai, is actually sitting on the board of ALIA. So we've got influence amongst other academies within uh, Europe and throughout Europe, which is very important from our point of view. And it means, hopefully, that the quality of Scottish research um, is seen not just uh, around the world, but uh, within our partners in Europe as well, about what Scotland is doing uh, and the quality of what we are doing as well. Chris. Uh, thank you. Just echoing what, what others have said, and um, when uh, Julie started, she'd said that the clue um, was in the title in terms of Amnesty International. The clue is in the title for us as well. It's the Scottish Human Rights Commission, and we're a national human rights institution. So, as others have said, all of our international work in terms of improving the human rights framework is with a view to, to bringing that back home into the, the small places. And um, the Scottish National Action Plan on Human Rights is very much about that, so negotiated actions to come out with, with, with outcomes around things things like, like poverty, around things like the effect of, of austerity, around the growing challenges for our ageing population. All of these things are, are contained within SNAP and there's real action happening related to them. In relation to, to access to justice, just to spend a, a very quick moment on, on the first point, it, it, is, it is a real challenge. Um, some of our, our sister organisations in other countries do have a quasi-judicial function. Their parliaments have decided to, to allow them to, to hear cases. They're generally very, very big and very well-funded because they, they need to be to take on individual cases. We've said that the, the court system does, does that. Um, and there is work by the Justice Committee and others to, to ensure that the, the court system is, is functioning um, effectively in terms of providing access to justice. Um, but there's also huge amounts being done to, to look at alternatives, and, and um, there's a lot of work being done on, on victims of historic abuse at the moment. Um, there's an apology law before Parliament. There's a whole bunch of, of other things to put in place, an inquiry, lots of other alternate ways rather than um, just, just the, the court system. So there is a lot, a lot going on there. Um, internationally, I'd, I'd like to make, make um, a point in terms of we work uh, with our colleagues at the European Network. Um, so we work directly with, with the UN where we have speaking rights in a number of fora and, and use those um, to try and um, focus international attention on what's happening in Scotland, both, both good and bad, um, to bring pressure to bear on, on government here. Um, at, at the European level, we, we do the same at both the Council of Europe and, and the European Union. Um, a lot of focus um, at the European level, at the Council of Europe over the last few years where we've played an active role, has been in relation to the reform of the European Court of Human Rights, which has been... Um, uh, certainly in need of reform, but, but has been subject to, to, to quite um, significant attack um, with the potential to undermine the rights of individuals to, to seek justice to, to that court. And I think one of the, the great successes that we've, um, <coughs> we've had over the last few years through a huge amount of energy is that it hasn't got worse. Um, I'm not saying that, that, we've, that the systems of the court have improved, but there was real risk that there would have been limitations of people being able to access that court, and those things haven't happened because a lot of work's been done. So sometimes a success is, is preventing regression. Um, and so I think that's quite important. And, and my last point in relation to that is, is one of the, the very interesting developments, which, which I, I hope we'll, we'll have time to talk about perhaps another time, is, is the role of parliaments. Um, and the growing recognition that, that national parliaments have an important role to play as, as part of the human rights framework. And we've seen this through, through resolutions at the, at the UN and the Council of Europe and, and the EU have all started to focus on this. The reform of the European Court is now very much focused on this. The most recent high-level conference that was held in, in, in Brussels um, focused on what Parliament should be doing to ensure that, that, that human rights um, are respected, um, not just in your role as legislators, but, but also in terms of serving your, your constituents. So there's a lot that's being done, and this is becoming a, a real new focus in Europe, I think, the growing understanding of the role that, that parliaments and parliamentarians at a national level, at, at, at a regional level, um, and, and also those, those um, 
those members who, who serve in, in dual capacities, like in the, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, where you have national politicians sitting in a, in a regional parliament, or directly elected ones like <coughs> at, at the European <coughs> Parliament. Um, and I think that this is one of the areas where there's a lot of focus at the moment and a lot of opportunity to, to develop um, uh, new roles, new understanding for, for members. One of the things that the Council of Europe were particularly interested in was what, how Scotland was taking one direction on human rights and maybe the rest of the UK was taking another one. So no doubt the same as me, there was a sigh of relief yesterday of no repeal bill, but a consultation, and I'm sure you'll be taking full part in the consultation at the UK government level. Uh, we certainly will, amongst others, and, and, uh, and our position has always been that, um, that the test is what will improve the, the protections and, and promotion of, of human rights. So no retrogression, how we can go further to, to put in place things that, that will um, improve human rights, and that any such change needs to be done in, in a fully participative way. So we certainly welcome any commitment to, to further consultation, and we will be strongly urging with our, with our partners that that needs to be something that's fully participative and involving everyone um, improving education as well. Julie. Yeah, just to you know, to echo um, what you're saying about the stark contrast between the approach of the, the Scottish government and the UK government. Obviously, the, the human rights situation in Scotland is not perfect in terms of the realisation of rights. That's why we need SNAP. But the the big difference is in the context in which we're working. We are pushing at an open door. There is a willingness to make progress in human rights, and you contrast with what's happening at UK level. And you know, the Human Rights Act brings that into to, you know really strong focus and the, the sort of political consensus up here, the society, you know, civil society consensus amongst the population, the strong support for the Human Rights Act, whereas that is not the case. And, you know, we work across the UK and I speak to my colleagues <coughs> in London who are very envious of the human rights environment that we have up here. And I think there is actually a lot of potential in Scotland to work together. And one of the things that, that we've recommended is having an international human rights strategy just to pull together the good work that, that is being done by the government, the parliament and across organisations in Scotland and taking that kind of Team Scotland approach to progressing human rights and trying to pull that together to be more of a beacon on the international stage and to try and bypass some of the, the negative attacks that are coming from the UK government on towards human rights. Okay, thank you, Julie. Adam. Mm. Uh, thank you. Um, this whole inquiry is about the efficacy and effectiveness of Scotland's international uh, engagement. Um, and really, I suppose what I'm, I'm trying to find out uh, today is, or indeed the whole committee is looking to actually some, make some recommendations at the end of the day how this can be improved. Um, I just wonder, going round the table, if you could give me uh, one thing that you think um, uh, needs improved and how we could do it. I, I noticed the SCVO, for example, were suggesting that there ought to be some sort of agency which would uh, pull things together for the third sector. Um, that might be one idea you, you might wish to um, tell us about, but for each of you, could you give us one area, one um, measure, one uh, priority that you would have for improvement in what we're trying to do? You want to start, Ali? <laughs> <laughs> um, and just uh, on terms of the, the agency thing, I think in the, our evidence we're suggesting that um, there's quite a lot of investment whether it's Scottish Government or, or an attention and focus goes into private enterprise and commercial enterprise to make new markets, to make collaborations. So you've got SDI, you've got Scotland Europa, you know, but it's not the same focus and attention given to civil society making its way um, in Europe or internationally um, because we do business together also um, and we collaborate not just around about changing policy but also about changing big societal changes that have a, a, a direct impact on everybody. Um, so what we were um, suggesting was that there needs to be more glue around all the disparate bits that happen within Scotland's civil society because we've got lots of individuals, lots of organisations that are reaching out and doing some good stuff. And we've not had, and certainly at SCVO, we've not had this, um, 
the ability to focus and harness all of that and we've been on the back foot you know reacting to things and try so we we our management board have made a commitment now to try and find a way to get us on the front foot mm -hmm. and what we would like i suppose is is to have a listening ear on how to help us all get on the front foot with some of these things um, because one of the things, the, one of the key things for us at ACVO, as well as all the influencing policy and, and trying to get opportunities opened up for the sector, whether it's transnational projects um, and, and all sorts of things, is, is strengthening participative democracy. Um, there are these two big ideas in democracy about representation and participation, and you guys are all part of the mm. representation part of democracy in the traditional sense. Um, per participative democracy is, for us, will bring about real fundamental change throughout our societies. And civil society organisations represent, have a different kind of representation. They represent the interests of, for instance, Peter's organisation, because he's sitting beside me, people who are in poverty or suffering poverty, who represents his in their interests better? or more, or continually, elected representatives of Peter's org organisation, he's day in, day out doing that. So, But he will also involve, and other organisations like him, will also involve all his users, his volunteers, his members, in the work that they're doing. So they're participating um, in their democracies. So a big part of what we want to try and achieve is to strengthen that participation that will bring about the bigger changes that are required throughout Europe. Would you, sort of IDOS, you know, an IDOS is international development umbrella. Would you, would you suggest something similar to that model? Is that what you're thinking? Well, we're trying to, uh, we're trying to um, look at how we can prioritise investment at SCVO, that we can begin to provide some of that glue because we've got a range of organisations that are doing European bits. We ourselves have got... Uh, relations with MEPs, with the European Economic and Social Committee. We've got our big ENA network of SCVOs with some staff in Brussels that we get very intermittent uh, capacity to, you know, we get a, a little bit of uh, money to do some work and then it sort of, you know, fades away and it's very, it's very hard. Um, and just getting information out there as well about uh, opportunities uh, you know, Horizon 2020 has springing a huge amount of opportunities, and Scotland is not benefiting from it enough because we haven't got the same Scotland Europa or SDI chuntering out all that information to our sector. And our sector would love to be involved much more on transnational work, but their ability to grasp it uh, in a an, in a very fast way. It's difficult, so we're looking at how we can make it easier for people to, to take up transnational opportunities. We get loads of people get in touch with us saying, "Can you've got a Scottish partner for this, got a Scottish partner for that, and we ourselves are not, we're not organised enough, enough to do that. So as I say, it's all about us tr trying to get onto the front foot with that, um, and we're looking at how we can staff up internally in order to provide that glue a bit better uh, for the sector, so um, we're kind of finding our own solution, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but we're very happy for you to help yeah. us with that solution, I think, is what I'd is say. reflected yeah. across the other, David? In, in answer to your, your question there, um, to, to not lose sight of, of what Scotland does well, and again, to re-emphasise re this point, and that's the, the engagement of, of civic society. This, this committee started off by looking at the Scottish Government's uh, international framework. I um, thought there was some good points in, in that framework. Obviously, while this uh, inquiry has been going on, um, the updated version has been released. For me, when I read it, though, um, the fundamental basis, the fundamental justification for Scotland's internationalism seems to be domestic economic gain. That seems to be the, the driver for it. And I think, I think we're selling Scotland short, if that's the case. If that's what we believe internationalism is all about, I think that flies in the face of a very proud 
uh, 200-year history of, of Scotland engaging internationally for reasons of global citizenship, for reasons of so social justice, for reasons of solidarity and support, of mutual benefit and mutual understanding. It's important that there are economic drivers, and I understand the reasons for that. But if that's the justification, I think that's a real weakness, and that's actually losing sight of, of what we as a country are doing quite differently to every other country in, in the world. And I think if we, if we lose that, it's just going to be another, another strategy, another international strategy, much like every other one that exists in the world. But actually, if we can celebrate, if we can put at the center what uh, value add that, that the people have in this, what volunteerism and social justice, what role that they have in this, uh, I think that, that's absolutely important, both for this parliament and for the government. Just give us a whole string of questions for the minister. <laughs> <laughs> Peter. Trying to, trying to answer Adam's question, I think uh, quite surprising that, that we've not come here with a, a long list of demands on government. And I think Ali has put it quite well, is that for, for us as a sector, um, for many civil society organisations, voluntary organisations, we recognise that we need to do better, that there are opportunities and we need to think about how we organise ourselves. And I know SEVO are doing that, the Poverty Alliance, EAPN across the UK is also in the process of doing that. But I think where, where, we, where we could be helped with that is through forums like this. I mean, this is, um, this is actually quite unusual. We don't often have these kinds of discussions, I would say. Um, so to maintain a, a relationship with the committee um, would be very important. But I think, again, David's, David's point is very well made. It's about saying what... It's about having a strategy that says what we're doing differently in Scotland, and there are many things, and being able to talk for us to our colleagues across Europe about what it is that we're doing differently. But also, I think, as our... Um, as our the, the agenda develops in Scotland, so we're, we're looking forward to the development of a new social justice action plan that will have a... Uh, a horizon up to 2030, I believe. Um, as we develop that, there is much that we need to learn from particularly other European countries. There is a lot that we can learn in terms of um, employability, in terms of reform of our welfare system from other parts of Europe. There's a lot that we can um, try and avoid as well, but there's lots that we, we can learn. And so I think if, if there's a demand and it's that that as Scottish Government, as a Scottish Parliament, that we look outwards um, and learn those lessons. And I think by working with civil society organisations that have those connections, then we can, we can help with that learning process. Okay. Yes, I, I just wanted to say as well that um, I, I think, echoing what, what David said, we should be very positive about ourselves as a country and what we have to give. Uh, one of the things I would say is that we... We have these 23 memoranda of understanding, but there are so many countries who would like to sign more memoranda with us. And that's partly because the quality of research in Scotland is such a high level. I mean, we punch above our weight in the UK in terms of the amount of money we get in Scotland through our universities. And that's because of the quality. Uh, and there's an opportunity to work even more with countries um, uh, that, that we can actually exchange researchers and exchange research at the high level. So. I think that that is important. I think there's more that we can do. And if we had more resource, then, then we could do it. The other thing I would say as well is, I've mentioned Connected Scotland as well. Uh, I think that working in partnership with organisations that might not be directly linked with what you're doing, but obviously offer opportunities um, to work together on slightly different projects can be beneficial as well. Um, we have been working, again, I've mentioned the Chinese, but we went across to China at the, begin, at the beginning of December last year uh, to do some workshops. And what we did were workshops not just with academics, but also with industrialists and business people as well. And we did that through the innovation centres, where we took three of the innovation centres across with us. Um, and that was through SFC that we, we got that, that opportunity. And we also worked with um, SDI in China as well to get other industrialists and people. Now, that's maybe not something that the RSC would have done if it had not been part of Connected Scotland. And that is building further links. So 
I think developing partnerships is a great opportunity for Scotland and, and us all to try and link together a little bit more. And that's one thing I might take from today as well as other people around this table is thinking perhaps maybe I can link a wee bit more with some of these organisations that I've spoken to as well. So I would say that. Great. It's all about connecting Scotland with other people, so we're delighted yep. to facilitate that. Jamie, you've got a quick question. Yes, well, well, David Jones just made the point that you know, Scotland has this incredible history of um, internationalism going on for 200 years. And I mean, I think that's true. I mean, it's Scotland's influence probably the rest of the world more than any other country I can think of in many ways. Um, I think my question, uh, I mean, the Royal Society of Edinburgh is a long established and very well respected body and um, has been through a lot of history. Uh, I suppose my question, I mean, I looked at your um, priorities and I think towards a new enlightenment is a, is a wonderful sort of motto to have. And um, how is that going in terms of uh, working, I mean, is there, what can the Scottish Government do or the Scottish Parliament do to, uh, to, to help with that? And is, are you finding that since devolution, uh, it is easier to do it, or is it more difficult? Um, a good question. I, I don't think... Uh, uh, first of all, let me say that Towards a New Enlightenment is very important for us. The, 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 the Royal Society of Edinburgh was created in 1783 from the first European Enlightenment, um, and the likes of David Hume and Adam Smith were all involved in, in the creation. Uh, and many of the great... Um, um, inventors and innovators throughout uh, the last 200 and odd years have also been fellows of the society. So we look to that. I think the belief is that talking to other countries worldwide, we know that we are a small country, but we punch above our weight because we come up with the ideas that mean that, mean that we do. And that is why the likes of, of, of China wants to talk to us in Scotland. They're very keen to have links with us on that sort of research side because they know the quality of what they get in Scotland. So I think that that is very important. Um, as regards what devolution has, has done for us, um, I think from the funding point of view, the, the, the funding of the, the, the Royal Society of Edinburgh and somewhere in the region of about 40% of our, of our money comes from Scottish Government through the Scottish Funding Council. We've moved around a little bit. Uh, but I think that where we are now with the Scottish Funding Council, they have an understanding about what the Royal Society of Edinburgh is trying to do. And I think that is helping an awful lot from what the RSE is, is doing. So I think that, that, I think that working closely with the Scottish Parliament the Scottish Government is very important for us. Um, and that's something that I would like to try and develop further over, over the years as they, as they come. Rod, you've got a final quick... Well, yeah, very quick, because it's uh, just a, a brief kind of point on back to where we were a few minutes ago. Um, if, on the human rights point and the importance of international uh, human rights, um, if I can summarise my perception of the UK government's position is that they are not, again, human rights, but they want to repatriate human rights. But can you put the case for looking at human rights in an international context? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think I think I think your, your starting premise is, is, is entirely right. Is is that the UK has been one of the key drivers for the improvement and the creation of, of an international human rights framework. Um, UK lawyers were involved and UK politicians were involved in the drafting of, of almost all of our international standards, which is why it, 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 it's particularly worrying when when we see a shift in position to move away from one of the key principles of human rights, which is universality. You can't pick and choose everyone by our very nature, by, by, by being human has, has human rights. Human rights are interrelated, they're interdependent. Um, the idea that you can pick and choose between human rights undermines the, the basic principle um, that, 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 we're all, that we're all human. Um, I, think, I think there's, there's massive concerns domestically in terms of um, sending a message that, that some people don't matter or some issues don't matter. And that there's, there's huge concerns with projecting this message internationally in that a country with uh, such a strong history of human rights protection um, moving backwards sends a message to other countries that it's who, who don't have such strong human rights records that it's okay for them to move backwards. And, um, and that there's real concerns, particularly in, in relation to, 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 some, to, to comments made in relation to, to things like the European Court of Human Rights, where, where the UK has taken a position not to implement decisions um, 
countries like 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 Russia and, and, and Turkey and 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 others um, with significant numbers of judgments against them don't say to the court we're not going to follow them they just kind of take a long time to discuss it and they pay out um, money to, to individuals and don't don't really change things but but the for a a high contracting party to to the European Convention to say that it will not follow the rules that it's agreed to sends a very very negative message um, and I think that that um, creates danger not just in, in the UK but but around the world. Do you answer your question, yeah, thank you. Lord? Can I? Thanks, we've sorry. really seriously used up all of our time this morning. <laughs> um, as you can see, we again, you know, topics here that we could, you know, exercise very, very well. Can I thank you all very, very much for all of your contributions and offer the same uh, invitation that if you have any other comments or uh, resolutions to problems or ideas, please feed them through uh, the committee, and we will endeavour to do the best with them that we possibly can. Can I thank you all for for coming along this morning? and move on very, very quickly to Agenda Item 3, which is our Brussels Bulletin. Um, I'm minded to suggest that we note the Brussels Bulletin and make, it, make our other committee colleagues aware of it, if anybody's got any burning issue. Nope, happy to do that. Well, that concludes this committee for this morning, and I thank you very much for your attendance, and see you all on the 4th of June. Now close this committee.